He is coming again. and That's uh, so per- appropriate for what we're going to be talking about as we study the book of Revelation. And I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to continue looking at this chapter here tonight. And tonight, the uh, title of the sermon, I guess you could call it, is Mystery Babylon and the Beast. So look at Revelation chapter 17 in, in verse number 1. It says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now remember, as we looked at this last week, we said that the big question that we have to answer coming into this section of Revelation is, who does this woman symbolize? Obviously, the woman here that John sees in this vision is a symbol. As we just read, John sees a woman riding on a beast. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet. She's adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. In her hand is a golden cup. The Bible says is filled with abominations. And on her, on her forehead is written, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And so this is obviously a symbol, but the question is, what does this woman represent? Is this the literal city of Babylon, that uh, the name that is written on her head is Babylon? Is that talking about the literal city, or is she symbolic for another city? Now, the last if you were here with us last Sunday night, we sought really to deal with that whole issue, and uh, I told you that some say that the woman here represents the city of Jerusalem. There are some that look at Revelation and say this is really the fall of Babylon in chapter 17 and 18 is nothing more than the fall of Jerusalem. It already took place. It's in history. It happened in 70 AD. Those who take a partial preterist position uh, of the book of Revelation in their interpretation or maybe a full preterist position say all of this is history. It's already happened. The the woman represents uh, Jerusalem. Babylon is the spiritual name. But I have a problem with that interpretation. I don't think the city here uh, is Jerusalem. You say, why? Well, if you notice this, it says this woman sits on many waters. In verse number 1, at the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. What does the waters symbolize? We don't have to wonder about that because John tells us in verse 15, and he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And so the waters are symbolic of all the nations and the peoples and the tongues. So this means that this city was then at one time uh, in charge, or we could say a world power that reigned over the people and the nations. This indicates world domination. And we have to ask the question, has Jerusalem ever had world dominion, dominated the world? And the answer to that is no. And so I don't think that this represents Jerusalem. And then other people say, well, this is representative of Rome. The city, uh, the woman represents the city of Rome. All of this matches Rome. And again, I would just say that the problem with that is, is that when you look at the mentioning of the city in chapter 17 and 18, the angel clearly and repeatedly refers to Babylon on the Euphrates throughout chapter 17 and 18. Look in chapter 17, look in verse 18. And notice what it says, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And so I think that it's, to me, it's saying it is the great city. This woman symbolizes that great city. And that is to say it's the city, the literal city of Babylon. And we'll get into this later as we continue to study, but as you look in chapter 18 and we look at the fall of Babylon, we see the description of the fall. All the characteristics about the city in the description of the fall match uh, the literal Babylon, okay? And so I think that this is referring to the literal city. So therefore, there's, it's going to rise. I told you that some scholars and some 
of those that are experts in Bible prophecy see three great signposts in the end days. One is the uh, is Israel becoming a nation? That's happened. The other is the rise of the uh, of, of the uh, Roman Empire, the EU. We're seeing that happen in the EU. There are 27 countries, and then the other would be the other signpost would be the rise of Babylon, and that's going to happen in the end. And so there's every indication if you interpret the Book of Revelation uh, literally, it has to say that the symbols here. We understand that there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation, but all those symbols have literal meanings. And if we take those literal meanings, we would have to say that the woman here represents that city. So therefore, uh, Babylon or modern Iraq will rise to world power in the end days. And we could say it like this, Babylon is a city, but it also is a system. Um, we, we, we use an expression, we say Wall Street. When I say Wall Street, what does your mind think of? Well, it, it thinks it's a literal place, right? There is a little place, place in New York called Wall Street. But also, when we say Wall Street, we think, of, we think of, of finances. We think of business. We think of world trade. And we think of the economy. And so it, Wall Street is a literal place, but it also represents a system. And we could say that about Babylon as well. It is a literal place, but it also represents a system. And there are actually two aspects to this system. Babylon represents false religion because false religion came from there, and it also represents a commercial system. And what we'll see in chapter 17 and 18 is that God is going to destroy it all. He's going to bring it all to an end. He will destroy religious Babylon, chapter 17. He will destroy commercial Babylon, chapter 18. Um, and so it's a false religious system centered in a literal city. Uh, Arnold uh, uh, Freutenbaum wrote this. He said, quote, Babylon the harlot represents the one world religious system that rules over the religious affairs during the first half of the tribulation. He goes on to say, she rules over the nations of the world the many waters, fully controlling the religious affairs and has the reluctant support of government. He continues, the headquarters of this one world religion will be the rebuilt city of Babylon, the mother of idolatry, for it was here that idolatry and false religion began. And he's right. All false religion originated there in Babylon. One could say that Babylon was the earth's first great city, and it will be the last great city. The place where false religion and rebellion against God originated will be the place where it will be destroyed. It will come full circle, and God will destroy it in the end. While I'm introducing this, go to, go to uh, the book of Genesis. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis, will you? And just look at chapter uh, 10 and 11 with me. Go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis, and let's look at this. Let's kind of take a look to help give us some perspective and some understanding. Um, again, this was the place where rebellion against God came to fruition. If you look at Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, what we see are the characteristics of the city of Babylon as it originated. It was built in rebellion against God. Look in Genesis 11, look in verse 2. It says, it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. The land of Shinar, this is where it all began. This is modern-day Iraq. This is the beginnings of Babylon. After the ark, they assembled all, everyone there in that place. History today recognizes Mesopotamia as the cradle of civilization. Mesopotamia literally means between two rivers nestled there between the Tigris and the Euphrates. This is where uh, human, humanity begins after the flood. And so um, this is where man's history begins. And as we said, history will come full circle. Um, but notice the characteristics of this city. Notice it starts with a godless leader. Go back to Genesis 10 and look at verse number 8. And Cush began Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So the Hebrew Scripture indicates that he was a mighty hunter. That is, he was a dictator, a tyrant. Um, 
he was uh, the, a man who took control. The idea of him being a hunter, he's not talking about hunting wild game here, but of men. And the next verse makes it clear. It says because it, uh, in verse 10, in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And so he was a ruthless killer who hunted and killed men and built a kingdom through violence, through tyranny. Uh, one commentator renders it like this, Cush began Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty despot in the land. He was an arrogant tyrant, defiant before the face of the Lord. Some even say that he is a type or a prefigure of the Antichrist. Nimrod, the name means rebellion. He's a type of the man of sin, the Antichrist, the lawless one. But we see then not only a godless leader, but we see a global cooperative laborer. Look in chapter 11, look in verse 3. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. They all came together, united for one big purpose. And what was that purpose? To build a city for ourselves. And the idea here is we're going to build without God. We can depend upon one another we don't need God in this, and so this is rebellion against God from the very beginning. We see a man-made false religion. Look in verse 4. They said, go to, let us build a, ta- a city and a tower whose top may reach into the heaven, and let us make a name lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. So here they're building a tower. This is an early uh, uh, pyramid um, you know, you might see some of these. You know, I remember uh, uh, several years ago, I uh, went to Honduras on a mission trip. We took some folks with our church. There was a church being planted down there, and we were supporting that work. And not far from where that church was being planted, there was a, uh, a Mayan civilization that um, was centuries and centuries old, um, just the ruins of that civilization. And it went on for acres and acres, and they had all kind of buildings, and they had these pyramids where you could walk up the steps all the way to the top, real high pyramids. And on the top, there are all these symbols because what they did there is that this is where they would look into the skies and they would, they would study the stars and, and they would worship the stars and worship the moon and so on. This is where false worship um, had its expression there on these towers. This goes all the way back to Genesis 11 where they were making their own religion This was an expression of religious unity. Again, one scholar writes this, a false religious system was born on the plains of Shinar in ancient Babylon where the first world dictator, Nimrod, defying God, built a tower that would reach to heaven. This tower was used for studying the stars and established the basis for astrology. John Wolvert wrote of this religious system, Babylon was important not only politically but also religiously. Nimrod, who founded Babylon, had a wife known as Semiramis who founded the secret religious rites of the Babylonian mysteries according to the accounts outside the Bible. A Semiramis had a son. It was allegedly a miraculous conception, and she conceived and had a son named uh, Tammuz. Um, this was a kind of like a counterfeit, false fulfillment of what God promised to do in sending the seed of the woman to Eve in Genesis 3.15. And out of this mother-son false religious system, um, a lot of false worship was born. Um, And so the legend of Semiramis and Tammuz began to spread around the world, and it invaded other cultures. And the names changed, but the idea was the same. In Assyria, it was Ishtar and Tammuz. In Phoenicia, it was uh, Ashtar, and and the sun was Baal. In Egypt, it was Isis, and the sun was Horus. In Greece, it was Aphrodite, and the sun was Eros. In Rome, it was Venus, and the sun was was Cupid. But this was just all false religion. And so Babylon was the origin of this false religious system. But also what we see here is a desire to achieve greatness. Look again in chapter 10, verse number 4, or excuse me, chapter 11, verse 4. And they said, Go to, let us build a tower, a city and a tower whose top may reach under the heaven, and let us make a, what, a name for ourselves. That's um, humanism. That's a desire to, um, to, to achieve greatness for self, for humanity. Again, this is without God. 
We don't need God. We have our own ingenuity. We have our technology. We don't need God. We got science. We got engineering. We got building. You know, we don't need God. Again, this is in rebellion. I remember reading one time of the great baseball player, Ted Williams. Do you, uh, any of uh, baseball fans know the name Ted Williams, one of the greatest hitters? And when he died, his daughter had his body frozen. And she said the reason she did this is because she believes that medical science one day will figure out a way to bring him back to life. She said, some people's faith is in God. My faith is in medical science. But that's the spirit of humanism. And that goes all the way back here to Genesis chapter 11, where they said, let's make a name for ourselves. We can do this on our own. We don't need God. It's a rebellious resolve to do things man's way, not God's way. What did God say to Noah and his family after they got off the ark? Look in Genesis chapter 9, look in verse number 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and what? Replenish the earth. Just go fill the earth, literally. Fill throughout the earth. In other words, don't stay in one spot. Scatter out, fill all the earth, replenish the earth. This is the command that God gave to Noah. By the way, this is the same command that God gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verse 22. Fill the earth, spread out. But notice in chapter 11, verse number 10, they don't do that. They said, go to let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach to the heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. We don't want to be scattered out. We want to all come together, and we all want to be interdependent. We don't need God. We'll make a name for ourselves. So this is in exact opposition to the command that God gave them. The whole city of Babylon began in rebellion against God with a cruel dictator for a leader. You know, in, in the Bible, we've always seen these two competing cities. We've seen Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon is the city of man. Jerusalem is the city of God. Babylon is reaching up to the heaven on their own. Jerusalem is coming down from heaven. We see this in Revelation 21. By the way, we'll see Babylon being destroyed. The new Babylon, which will rise up, will be destroyed, but the new Jerusalem will come down from God out of heaven, and that's where we're going to live. Uh, Babylon was built for man's glory. Jerusalem built for God's glory. You know, in Scripture, Babylon is the second most mentioned city in the Scripture. You want to know the first most mentioned city in Scripture? It's Jerusalem. Babylon is the city of confusion. Jerusalem is the city of peace. Babylon is where man's tower was built. Jerusalem is where God's temple was built. Babylon is symbolized by a harlot. Jerusalem in Revelation is symbolized by a bride. Babylon will be destroyed. Jerusalem will be be eternal. And so as we come to Revelation 17, we see God's judgment on Babylon. This city that began so many years in rebellion will be destroyed again. During the tribulation period, this city will rise to power. It'll become a world-dominant power. The literal city, the capital city, will be the capital for the Antichrist in the end. And so John sees Babylon in this vision personified as a gorgeous prostitute, drunk on the blood of God's people, yet doomed to be destroyed by even the very Antichrist and his forces. But let me just, with all that in mind, that was all introduction. Now we have to get into, you know, I always spend too too long sometimes in introduction. Forgive me for that. But Let's just talk about two things here tonight. Number one, the investigation of the mystery, and then I want to talk about the interpretation of the mystery. So look in chapter 17. Let's look at the, let's investigate this woman. Again, we see the woman in chapter 17, verse 1. Notice what I call the woman's authority in verse 1. She sits upon many waters. It says, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. This is all about judging this, this, this harlot. And it's interesting, and interesting to me that Babylon is, pre- is presented as a woman with a cup in her hands sitting on many waters because 
This is the same imagery used in the Old Testament prophecies about Babylon. For example, in Jeremiah 51, 7, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hands that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Jeremiah 51, 13, O you who dwell by many waters, rich in treasures, your end has come, the thread of your life is cut. If you were with us last week when we looked at the prophecy, what I call the rise of Babylon in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 7, where um, there is a basket, a big basket, a woman is in that basket, there's a lead lid on that basket, and it says in Zechariah chapter 5, verse number 8, and he said, this is wickedness. That is, this woman that is in this basket, this is the personification of wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the lead weight, or the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. Here's this woman, and she's in the basket. She represents Babylon because she's placed on a base there in the land of Shinar in this vision that Zechariah has. And so, it's interesting to me that, again, here in Revelation now, Babylon is pictured as a woman, and the waters, as we saw already in verse 15, are symbolic of the peoples and nations. To be over the waters is an idea of authority in ancient days. Remember, Jesus came walking on the waters. There's a lot of rich symbolism in that. That is to say that the Messiah, the Son of God, will be the one who will have absolute control over the waters. The sea in that day was the image of chaos, of nations rising in rebellion. But who has control over that? Who walks on the waters? Who has sovereign control over all the nations and the peoples? It's Jesus, the Messiah. So this is the image here. This woman uh, has authority, and her influence has reached to all the nations her authority is over all the people and the nations. This woman will dominate the world. We see the woman's authority, the woman's alliances. We see this in verses 2 and 3. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have, made, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. This harlot will not be allied just with the rulers and influential people, but all who dwell on the earth the Bible says, and that is just simply speaking about, it's a term, a technical term for unbelievers. They were all made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So she will, and, and the idea here of immorality is false religion. That's how it's used in the Old Testament to be uh, an idolater is spiritual adultery. It is spiritual immorality. To become drunk, again, is the idea of those who are intoxicated with this false religion, this whole system. And who will she influence? The political leaders. Again, we see in verse 2, the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Uh, all those that are in political authority, the common people of the world, the masses will all be deceived. This is false religion taking over the whole world. You know, People, they talk about religious freedom. Oh, we want religious freedom. Well, the world will have religious freedom. Uh, you, know how, you know what religion does? Religion sends people to hell. That's what it does. Religion, you know, I don't, want, I don't want freedom of religion. I want everyone worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to let you know, that's where I am on that. You know, um, you say, well, you know, do you believe in, in Muslims being able to worship? No, I don't. I think that there's one God. He's the true God, and you should be worshiping the true God. So, no, I'm not for religious freedom in that sense, no. Our country was built upon Christian principles. I know that that is not a popular thing to say nowadays, you know, um, but it's true. We have these, these revisionists trying to redefine history, but our country was built on the principles of the Word of God, of worshiping the true God. But there's going to come a day when false religion will dominate the world. There'll be one religion in the world that everyone will have to worship under. Um, eventually, false religion will first start out, you know, 
very broadly, but then it'll all narrow down because you know why? The Antichrist will get to the point where he will not tolerate any other worship than the worship of himself. And that's where this, re- this relationship that the beast has with the woman will end. Because what do we see happening to the woman and the beast here in this? Look in verse 16 of chapter 17. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. In the vision that John has, at first there's an alliance with the woman and the beast. But towards the end of this vision, the beast will cast the woman down and will devour her and will destroy her. And so um, let me, let, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Let's go back to verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. In the vision, he's carried into the wilderness. Interesting, where is Babylon located? In a, a wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. She was sitting on the waters. Now she's sitting upon a beast. And notice the description, having seven heads and ten horns. In verse number four, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a great name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. So notice in John's vision, she's riding upon this scarlet colored beast, and the, and the color here is associated with luxury. It's associated with splendor and royalty. It's also associated with sin. And the idea that she's riding this beast to me seems to indicate that the beast is supporting her. And I think it conveys the idea of the woman having some control over the beast. But there's going to come, again, this is the beast here. Who is the beast? Well, um, we're going to find out. Just hold on there. But let's look at the woman's apparel. In verse number 4, we saw she adorns the this royalty, this, this color of prosperity. And so this has the idea of, of luxury, of economic prosperity, of wealth. And then we see the woman's abominations in verse number 5. Actually, the end of verse 4, she has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head, Again, we saw that in verse 4, Mystery Babylon. But look in verse number 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So she, is writ- she has this name written on her. By the way, did you know in, Roman, in the Roman world it was customary for harlots to wear a headband with their name on it? And here she's a mystery. This is the idea that It's referring to more than just, I think, a literal location of a city. It's referring to a system. She's a mother. She represents that which begins with Babylon and continues on throughout history. She is the source through which much wickedness and spiritual adultery has come. She has conceived and birthed false religion all over the world. She has many children. And all the deceptive false religions are her children. Again, David Hawking wrote this, the false religion symbolized by her has permeated all history from the time of Babylon until the present day. All false religion, all, you know, New Age religion, we could call it satanic worship, astrology, apostate, cults, and all of that starts with her, this woman, all false religion began there. One one writer said this, quote, I once attended a day of lectures at a New Age retreat center near Baltimore, Maryland. What a shock, right? One speaker summed his points up by explaining what was meant by the coming, quote, New Age, then enthusiastically concluded with a statement that should chill Bible-believing Christians. He said it all started in Babylon, folks. It all started in Babylon. And that's true. She will be the source of all false religion. We see her atrocities in verse number 6, where she is not only a mystery and a mother, but she's a murderer because she's drunk with the blood of the saints, 
with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And John said, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. In this vision, she's drunk. She's staggering in her drunkenness. She's drunk from the blood of martyrs, of people she has killed. She has been behind the murder of all the saints of God throughout all of history. From the very first one killed, which was, we could say, when Cain killed Abel, until the last Christian martyr in the tribulation period. Uh, False religion, you realize how much religion has killed and martyred people? False religion, think about that. Um, And I don't have time to give you a historical survey of that. But it's just, it's remarkable when you think about the millions that have been killed from this, this false religious system. And so John is astonished at this woman. Now, that's the investigation, but let me show you the final thing. Number two, the interpretation of the mystery. And John really, he's trying to get understanding of this. In verse number six, he says, I wondered with great admiration. But then in verse number seven, and the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which has seven heads and ten horns. John didn't really understand all this. He wondered and he needed some help, and so the angel will give him this interpretation. John says, I'll, or the angel says, I'll help you. Verse 8, the beast which thou sawest, what, which was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So who is this beast? Well, that phrase, which was and is not and is about to be, that refers to the Antichrist. You might remember in chapter 13, the Antichrist will have a wound and will die and then will recover from that wound. Some say this is kind of an imitation of the the death and resurrection of Christ. This is Antichrist, and he is making the world wonder by having victory over death or coming back from the dead. And so um, this is who the beast is right here. And so what this shows is that in the beginning, sometime during the tribulation period, there will be an alliance between Babylon and the Antichrist. That, again, will be his city. That will be his capital center there. Um, And yet there will come a time when, however, uh, he will destroy even that because he wants all the worship, being drunk with power. He wants all of that for himself, that is to say, the Antichrist. What about the seven heads? What does that symbolize? Look down in verse number 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Here the angel informs John, this calls for a mind with wisdom. That is, the truth that is being presented here symbolically requires some spiritual insight to be understood. It's difficult to get the right interpretation of this unless we get some wisdom from God. But here's this angel that says this, and the seven kings, and here's the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short time space. Now, so the angel informs John that the beast's heads are seven hills upon which this woman sits, and uh, these seven mountains represent seven kings, or we could say they represent uh, kingdoms where there are kings in charge of this. Um, Now, again, this is why some people, when they look at the woman here, they think that the woman represents the city of Rome. Why? Because Rome was a city known for seven hills. And so that's why a lot of people, when they study this, they divert automatically to the woman representing the city of Rome. Many ancient writers, for example, Victorinus, who wrote the first commentary in the book of Revelation, he identified the seven hills as Rome. Again, often the city described as the city of seven hills. Um, and so this this has led a lot of people to conclude that this is talking about Rome. Rome will be the capital of the coming world empire Um, because, again, Rome was situated on seven hills. Um, But a close study 
reveals you don't have to really take that position. Let me tell you why. Because uh, evidence in the text also suggests that this is really not talking about literal hills, but it's talking about kings or kingdoms, we could say. And we don't have to wonder about that because it tells us that. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And so the text tells us that these are seven kings, or literally kingdoms. These mountains are not literal mountains. So it doesn't have to be speaking about the city of Rome. Oftentimes in Scripture, mountains are associated with kingdoms. Um, and by the way, if it, this is why it takes spiritual understanding. I mean, if, if it was really the Roman city or the city of Rome, um, it re- really wouldn't require a lot of spiritual wisdom because everyone knew that Rome was situated on seven hills. But again, that's, I don't think that's what it's talking about here. The seven hills represent seven kingdoms. Mountains are sometimes used in Scripture to represent rule or power. For example, Psalm 30, verse 7, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Isaiah 2, verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And so I think this is referring to to kings and their kingdoms, literally the kingdoms. Five are fallen. This is referring to the five previous world empires, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. One is, which one is that? Well, that is the one where John, where he existed when he present, when, presently when he wrote the book of Revelation. That was the Roman Empire The other is not yet come. This will be the final world empire. I think this will be the empire of the Antichrist that he will reign over. And notice it says he must continue a short space. Um, Now, so I think that uh, this is referring to 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 the kingdoms and the coming kingdom of the Antichrist. But notice verse 11 where it says, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now, someone might ask, how can the beast, the Antichrist, be the eighth king, and yet also be of the seven? How can he be seven and eight? I think the answer lies in verse number eight, where it says, this beast that was, and is not, and yet is. You see, the Antichrist will be in charge, and then he'll lose that power. He'll, perhaps through his a fake miracle of death, and then when he is, has this fake resurrection, he will come back to power, and he will be not only the seventh, but he will be the eighth as well. He will have two reigns, uh, two terms, you could say, two different separate terms. What about the ten horns in verses 12 through 14? The ten horns are ten kings that haven't yet re- received the kingdom meaning they had no earlier kingdom. And so I think that this will be part of the administration of the Antichrist. Perhaps there are 10 uh, governors under his kingdom there, but the Bible says they will receive authority for one hour. That is to say, they won't reign very long. They'll have, they'll have a short reign of power, but the one purpose they will have is to give power to the beast who will make war. Look at verse 14. And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And so this is another reason why I I, I don't think that this this woman here is referring to Jerusalem or the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Um, How can this be 70 A.D.? According to 70 A.D., uh, uh, according to the preter- preterist view, this is God's judgment on Jerusalem for what they did to the Messiah. The destruction of Jerusalem was a judgment f- from God because they rejected Jesus Christ. But in 70 AD, it's the Roman army that goes in, and they're the instrument of God's punishment. 
But how can then this refer to 70 AD? Because what we see here is that um, they're making war against the Lamb. In what way did the Roman army in 70 AD make war against the Lamb? That just doesn't match. Not at all. They were not making war against the Lamb. They were making war against those who rejected the Lamb in the city of Jerusalem. And also notice who returns with Jesus in this event. We see in verse 14 that they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Who is that? That's the believers. This is talking about when Jesus Christ comes again at the second coming, he'll bring the saints of God with him. That didn't happen in 70 AD. That didn't happen in Jerusalem. Those that are with him are the called and faithful. Again, that is referring to believers. And in verse 15, again, the waters we already saw was the nations. And the woman in verse 18, notice this is that city, that capital city there. It will be a rebuilt Babylon, um, just as we had talked about before. And the world will come and worship only uh, the Antichrist there. Look at verse 17, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. God will put it in the hearts of people to do this, to worship the, the Antichrist, the beast, at that time, because this will fulfill the will of God. God's the one that's going to play the final note here. God is the one that's arranging all these things that will bring all of this destruction on the Antichrist and his whole system. We could say that God is the one who will play the final note here. God will have the last word in all of this. And again, all that to say that God will destroy false religion and evil and wickedness at the very place it began in the city of Babylon. History will come full circle. At the second coming of Jesus Christ, it will be destroyed and God will play the final note. I read that uh, the great composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, that uh, his children uh, a lot of times had trouble getting their father's attention, and they figured out a way to get his attention. They say the easiest way to get their father's attention was to get, sit down at the piano and begin playing a few lines of music and then to leave off the last note. When they left off the last note, that would get the father's attention. And he would walk in and wonder why the last note has not been played, you know. Let me tell you something, friend. God is going to play the last note. He's going to get the last word. And again, Babylon will be destroyed. Now, here we see in chapter 17 the destruction of religious Babylon. Next week, we'll look in chapter 18 where we see uh, the fall of commercial Babylon and again, what we'll see is how this lines up perfectly with the Old Testament prophecies given about the fall of Babylon. Now, the reason some people say this can't be the literal city is they say, oh, Babylon was already destroyed. It has not been destroyed the way the Old Testament said it would be destroyed. That hasn't happened yet, which means it will come in the future. And chapter 18 lines up perfectly with those prophecies. Let's, let's bow for prayer together tonight. Father, we thank you as we study the Scripture that we see a God who is absolutely sovereign over the events of the world and that all things are happening under your sovereign control and that, Lord, we are living in these last days and we know that our Savior is coming again. Lord, we're reminded of this when we, we look in our, our Bible, we see passages like this and we look out in the world and we Look at what the newspaper says, what the TV says, how things that are taking place in the world just seem to be lining up perfectly with what, Lord, you said will happen. And so, Lord, we have absolute, total faith and confidence in your prophetic word. We know that in the end, sin will not win and faith will not fail. And so, Father, may this encourage our hearts and may this, Lord, get us to be continually busy about your business, building your kingdom, that, that kingdom that is coming that is an unshakable kingdom where Jesus Christ shall come and shall reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Lord, may we be diligent about your business. May we put forth the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And we do it for your honor and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.